Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Kriebel, and I am the head coach of the Information Lab Data School. And this session is a repeat talk from the one I gave at Fanalytics at Tableau Conference 2018 in New Orleans. And the subject of this talk is about why I created the Financial Times visual vocabulary in Tableau. And to start off, I'm going to give you a bit of housekeeping detail. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to post them on the right-hand side of your screen. There should be a, a, uh, an area to ask questions. If you could also include your name, that would be great. That way I can respond to you directly by name. And hopefully you enjoy this talk. And uh, feel free to pass it on to anybody else once, the, once you see the recording email at the end. So as I said in the summary of the presentation or of, of the webinar, we're all in a never-ending search for resources that help us pick what we think is maybe the best chart for the situation with the data that we have. The Financial Times created the visual vocabulary to help us all make better chart choices. And I saw this as a huge learning opportunity for me and also a gap that was missing in the Tableau market. So we can all look at the PDF that the Financial Times created for us, but there was no information or no demos of these same charts in Tableau. So that's the primary reason for why I created the visual vocabulary. Okay, so again, my name is Andy Kriebel. I'm the head coach of the Information Lab Data School. You can find me on Twitter at, at bizwizbi. My blog is bizwiz.com, and I also blog on the Makeover Monday website, makeovermonday.co.uk and on the Data School website at thedataschool.co.uk. So what is the visual vocabulary? Well, it's primarily two things. It was created by the Financial Times visual journalism team as a poster and an accompanying website to assist their designers and journalists to select the optimal chart for, the data, visual, for data visualizations. The Financial Times visual journalism team needed a way for their journalists and graphics teams to quickly pick a chart that works, plug in the data, and off they go. I had the great pleasure of meeting this journalism team shortly after I released the Tableau version of this. And they were incredibly excited to see the work that I had done and to be able to pass on the knowledge that, that they created. And it was a really interesting experience for me because I got to see it live in action. One of their journalists was working on building a chart for one of their articles. And I got to see that their internal tool that they use to actually create the charts. They can plug in some data. It suggests a list of charts. It automatically creates the chart for them. They can embed it in their articles, and off they go. Really, really impressive. Really impressive team. But this talk is about why I created the visual vocabulary in Tableau. And the purpose of this talk is to, is to not only go through my personal reasons for doing this, but I also want to give you some advice on why I did it and things you can take and how you can go about learning. So first and foremost, building this, building the visual vocabulary in Tableau was an opportunity for me to practice and to learn. I was doing it for selfish reasons. I wanted to learn how to build a lot of these charts that I haven't built before. And I thought it would be a really fun exercise to kind of put them together in the same sort of format as the Financial Times in those nine different chart types or nine different categories. I feel like if I don't learn something every day, that I'm wasting an opportunity. I'm constantly seeking out learning opportunities so I can set an example for the people I train at the data school. And hopefully I'm setting an example for the people in the Tableau community as well. I strive to learn something every day, and I hope that you do the same. There were nine chart types I hadn't built before, meaning I was giving myself nine learning opportunities. On top of that, lots of the other charts were derivations of work that I had done before. All of this learning stretched my knowledge. It's kind of like running. If you do the same run every day, you won't get any faster. You have to mix in sprints and intervals, different lengths. Data visualization is very similar. You need to stretch your data, your, you need to stretch your capabilities in order to let your data viz muscles grow. Find opportunities to challenge yourself, and you'll grow faster than you ever have before. 
I also saw this as an opportunity to share with the Tableau community. I love the Tableau community and I love helping others. I've gotten so much from the Tableau community and it's completely changed my life and I'm hoping that I can give other people that same impression and that same feeling. The community is the heart and soul of Tableau. It's what differentiates Tableau from its competitors. When I can share what I've learned and when I can help others, I do it without any questions asked. I know that I'll get way more back in return. And as I said, to be honest, I build and share content not only with the not only by building the visual vocabulary, but a lot of the content that I create on my blog I do for selfish reasons. For me, blogging reinforces my learning. When I write something down, it makes it stick in my brain. And why not share it with others? When I have to write it in a way that teaches others, I learn how to be clear, simple, and communicate effectively. So I've got some tips for you for how you can go about learning and building your career. The first thing is to make your learning intentional. The number one excuse I hear from people that don't develop their skills is that they don't have enough time. We hear that excuse all the time, and I call BS on that. I have four kids, I have a full-time job, I train for marathons, and I still find time to learn. If you want to get good, you have to make the time for intentional practice. When I trained for the Limassol Marathon in Cyprus, I followed a six-day-a-week training plan. I built this structure into my day. Create a routine that works for you, not only in exercise or health or anything that you do, but in your data visualization practice. Make it part of your routine. Be intentional about your practice. Pick a topic that interests you because it'll be more fun. You'll get more invested in your learning and you'll enjoy learning more. Take Johnny Walker as an example. He loves birds. He finds data, analyzes it, and builds stunning visualizations. His work is great because he loves the topic. Sure, he's got great design skills too, but he progresses more quickly because he has a direct impact, uh, interest in the topic. Pick a topic that interests you, whether it's basketball or sports or, you know, or maybe you have, uh, maybe you're into knitting or you're into traveling, whatever it might be, find a topic that you're interested in. Surely you have a passion about something. Find data around that topic and build your visualizations. Maybe that kind of becomes your signature and build your portfolio around the things that you're interested in. Schedule time into your day for practice. Practice what you know you need to practice what you know you need to improve. At the data school, everyone's required to teach whatever they're weakest in. And we, we've often seen those develop into their strengths. The point is that we make learning a priority. You have to invest in yourself because most likely your company isn't going to do it for you. Book out time in your schedule to train yourself and to practice. That's the only way you're going to get better. You have to be deliberate about your practice. And never, ever leave anything half done. When you start creating a visualization or writing a blog post, finish it. Don't wait until later to get it done because chances are you won't finish it. But also keep in mind that nothing is perfect. You could iterate forever. The point is to get your content out. Publish it, one take. Never leave a, leave a blog post or a visualization half done. Stick with it, see it till it's done, and get it published. You're much more likely to finish it that way. Consider creating your own style. Filippo Mastriani of the Information Lab in Italy is a great example of building a style over time. When you see a viz on Tableau Public, you can often immediately identify it as his. He's built his own brand and his own, his own style over time by creating lots and lots of visualizations and practicing and being deliberate about his practice. So build your own style. Maybe you have a font that you love, even though Tableau Public might not support it. Maybe you have a size or a color that you like. They all help to build your signature style. So consider doing like something like that because then people will recognize really quickly that that's worked by you. 
At work, you can develop your skills by holding Tableau doctor sessions. You will have no idea what questions you're going to get. It helps you think on your feet and work your way through problems in a systematic manner. So challenge yourself. Find opportunities that you can extend your skills. Find opportunities to help other people grow their skills. And you'll probably grow even faster than they are because you're the one teaching the content. The teacher always learns more than the student. Sharing content helps you build your personal brand. Your Tableau public, file, public profile is basically your resume or your CV. Creating content, helping others, documenting what you've learned, they're all simple ways that you can start building your own brand and your own portfolio. No one's going to build your brand except for you. Don't count on your company to do it for you. You have to take it into your own hands, build your own profile. Consider Pablo Gomez, which you can see on the screen now. He's built this amazing portfolio, and he can take that to any of his clients that, that are interested in working with him and say, here's some examples of the work that I can do. This is his portfolio. They don't ask him for a CV. They want to know what he's done. He's a consultant. They're interested in knowing the kind of work that he's done. Your portfolio, your Tableau Public portfolio, your blogging, those are the things that are going to get you jobs now. Because once you get hired in a role, nobody cares about where you, uh, the, the place you went to school, what your degree is in. All they really care about is you getting the job done. So build up your portfolio. Make building your brand a priority. Be intentional, be deliberate, and invest in yourself. So thank you very much for listening to this webinar. And now I'll open it up to questions. I know this was short, but the, the Fanalytics webinars or, or the Fanalytics sessions are only 15 minutes each. So my key takeaways from you for this talk are to be deliberate about what you've learned, be intentional, I'm sorry, be deliberate about your learning, be intentional, pick a topic that you're interested in and build your own brand around that, and finish what you start. Lastly, it's very important to challenge yourself. Do this through your routine. Pick topics that are challenging to you. Maybe pick a topic to teach at work. Find something that's going to stretch you, and your skills will develop quicker than you can imagine. So I hope this was helpful for you. And I'll leave the, I'll leave the webinar open for a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to post them on the right-hand side, and I'll, and I'll respond to them. So it's over to you guys now. OK, somebody said they like my attitude. I guess that's good. Thank you very much. I guess I can give a little bit of feedback on that. Um, I don't know exactly why they're, what part they're referring to in particular, but I'm very deliberate about my learning. I, I have a very structured day. I do all of my fitness training first thing in the morning. I tend to get up around 5.30. I do my training, and I usually get to the office around, uh, around 7 o'clock. And that gives me time to have some breakfast and start doing my blogging or do Makeover Monday or do Workout Wednesday or record a video. I use that as my particular time to learn. But I build that, I, I learn every day because I build that time into my schedule. I'm very deliberate. I leave my computer at home, or I'm sorry, I leave my computer at work during the week. I bring it in on Mondays and I take it home on Fridays. So that means that when I come into work, I have to be uh, very deliberate about my time. So I book that into my day. Okay. Um, so uh, one question came in. I'm not sure who this is from because they didn't leave their name. But um, they asked, how long did this take me? That is a fantastic question. I don't know exactly, but it took me a long time. Um, let's see, I forget how many charts. Let's say there's, there's nine pages, and there's, uh, let's say, an average of seven. So there's probably 60 charts or so. I don't know exactly off the top of my head. I would say, um, in total, it probably took me uh, between building all of the charts and designing the workbook 
and then creating a mobile version of it. Um, I would say it took me a good 60 to 70 hours if I had to guess, but it, it was definitely not a short amount of time. But it was really fun to learn, especially the charts that I hadn't learned before because I had to go find resources for those. And I linked to all those resources uh, in the workbook itself. So, um, you know, you can watch those. There are a lot of great videos out there from other people. So I, I found that a really fantastic way to, to, stress, to stretch myself. Um, somebody asked, will, uh, will this be available as, as a link after the session you'd like to share with the team? Um, yeah, what I'll do is after the recording comes up, I will, um, I'll post both the recording and the, uh, the slides in my, um, uh, the recording and my slides in, uh, on, on my blog on bizwiz.com. Okay. So, uh, okay, so Graham Kemp Jones. Okay, Graham, thanks for the question. He, Graham is the one that asked how long it took me. Okay, um, all right. Okay, here's another question from Shane. Please tell us about a limitation that you tackled and how you overcame it. I'm assuming that Shane means uh, in, in respect to creating this workbook. So um, let me actually, I'm going to go ahead and, and bring the workbook up and then I'll, I'll share my screen and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain to you a couple of them that were particularly challenging for me. Um, I need to find it first. Here we go. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And again, Shane's question was, was there anything that was particularly difficult? The answer is yes. Uh, okay, so let me flip over here. Okay, so, um, oops, there we go. So there's, I'm gonna stick this in presentation mode for now. Um, so uh, I'm gonna flip through all of the different charts. Hopefully I don't get any error messages about data sources. Uh, I'm just gonna flip through the chart, Shane, and, and hopefully this'll, this'll um, pique some of my interest. So I knew how to do most of these. Um, the violin plot was particularly fun to build, so I used a, um, um, an Alteryx workflow that was built that uh, Ben Moss, when he was in the data school, he wrote a uh, blog post on how to create a violin plot. And I'd always wanted to create one of those, so that was a really interesting exercise. Really, the, the, all, what Alteryx creates is the, is the, uh, the, background, uh, the background image there. Um, going through some of the other ones, uh, the change over time. Um, I'd never done um, a, what's called a priestly timeline before. So let me scroll down here. This, it's basically a Gantt chart, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's just this one happens to show the, uh, the, um, uh, how long somebody lived. The circular timeline, now that, that was, it wasn't particularly challenging, but that was another new one I built. It was, it was different than things I built before. And then the seismogram was pretty interesting. So the seismogram is basically, uh, you get the same length on each side of the axis. So if you have like, let's say, um, sales of 100, it would go both to the, to the right for 100 and to the left for 100, or you could divide it by two and do it 50-50. Um, but there were some in particular, I believe they were in the, so the sunburst chart was really, really difficult to build. Um, that one probably took me a good three or four hours to make. Um, I don't think I'd ever actually use one but I found it uh, a really interesting exercise. Um, uh, I believe it was Ken Flerlidge that has the, the tutorial for the ARC, uh, ARC graph. I think I have the ARC, yeah, Ken Flerlidge has the, um, the tutorial for the ARC chart, and that was really interesting to build. And you can see when I highlight, over, highlight it over, you can see a bottom half here. It's really just a donut chart, um, and it's just some calculations that require you to just get the top half. So that was pretty fun to build. But the sunburst was, it was incredibly difficult. Um, and if something's that hard to build, I probably won't build it again because I don't, um, I don't uh, if, if it's that hard for me to build and to explain to people, I probably won't use it. Now, some of the other ones that were really fun to build, uh, the, the scaled cartogram was pretty cool. So I followed a tutorial from, let me find the scaled, so that was also from Ken. Uh, so if I go to his website, um, oops, that's linking to him as the person. Uh, I think this will go, there we go. So uh, he's got a tutorial here on how to do it. And uh, it links to, I believe this links to another piece of software. Yep, so it goes to this, um, 
this uh, software here. So that was super, super helpful. And that was really fun. I, I really liked I really liked building that one. Um, the rest of them I've done before. Um, and then the last one in the flows. Um, so I, I, for the Sankey diagram, um, I followed a tutorial on that because I I've built one before, but I couldn't quite remember how to do it. And the chord diagram, uh, Noah Salvatera has a has a, a tutorial on that. And man, that was that was really really challenging to get the uh, the table calculate calculations right. But to answer your question, Shane, um, I just persisted. I guess would be the way that I would the way that I would describe that. Okay, so let me scroll down here through some of the questions. Thank you for continuing to ask questions. Michelle, thank you for the very nice uh, words. Um, okay, okay. Um, okay, so somebody who is a PhD, PhD student um, left a, uh, an interesting comment that they wanted to add. They said, uh, finding people that share the same interests is also very important. So they're a PhD student that works at home most of the time and their, their routine makes them feel tired, but once, you once they interact with someone, they feel fired up again. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good point. If you're kind of an independent contractor or something, you know, find a coffee shop or find some people that have similar interests as you and get involved in those, in those activities. Um, okay, so another question is, what software does the Financial Times use to do their charts? It's an internally built tool, but I believe they're built on top of D3, but don't quote me on that. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, have I, so Ryan Suarez asked me, have I practiced using any other database tools other than Tableau? And how important do I think it is to learn a variety of visualization software? Um, yes, I, I actually do practice. Um, I use uh, Power BI sometimes, um, and I use, I've used Google Data Studio. I've built some things in D3. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, of course, Excel. Occasionally, you build things in Excel. But to, to answer your other question, uh, how important do I think it is to learn a variety of visualization tools? I think that's very important. Of course, I specialize in Tableau, but um, uh, what it helps me do is understand what other tools are doing when they're trying to compete with Tableau, because um, at the Information Lab, we're, we're Tableau resellers, so it's important for us to know what the, what the competition is up to. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that I've come to realize is that building things in the other tools, not Tableau, um, is much easier once I have all of the anal analytical work done. So when I need to build something in Power BI or in Google Data Studio, I build it in Tableau first, and that gets me you know, 99% of the way there when I'm into the other tools because they're not really data exploration tools. So uh, like Power BI, for example, you can't really do data analysis in it. You have to kind of know what you want ahead of time. Um, uh, okay, so this is an interesting question. So uh, in a production environment, where I assume this is at work, where you have no idea what the data will look like tomorrow, how do you decide on the type of chart, story, et cetera? Well, um, if it's something you're going to throw away each day, then you might use a different chart type every day. But if it's something that, you know, uh, that is, it's the same data, but it's just updating every day, I'm not sure why you would need to continue to change the chart type. So I would say you would probably stick with the same chart type. Uh, okay, so where can you download this workbook? Um, I do not make it available for download on Tableau Public because people were stealing it and uploading it onto their own profiles. So I've now since disabled uh, download. So sorry about that. Um, if I do know you, you, you are more than welcome to send me a message, uh, an email, and um, let me know what purpose you would be using it for, and I'll consider, uh, I'll consider sending it to you. OK. Um, yes, yeah, so OK, so some of the other charts, uh, for example, radar charts, sunburst Cord seem particularly complex for use in journalism and in business. What is my take on using these type of charts? Um, that's an interesting question. When I went over to see the Financial Times, they had actually, uh, they have a new version of the PDF and some of those charts were removed for that very same reason. They found them, you know, they didn't communicate very well. Um, those charts are great for a learning exercise, but for me, I would probably rarely use them because I think it's, it makes the communication too difficult. I prefer things that are very simple, clean, and, and easy to understand. Um, so 
yeah, my take is use them if you want to learn, but uh, I'd be very, very careful if you're using them as a way to communicate to your audience because they're, unless somebody's an expert in that kind of chart type, they'd be incredibly difficult to understand quickly. Okay, so that is all of the questions in the, uh, the backlog. So if anybody else has a question, the floor is open. Okay, maybe give it another minute. And thank you everybody for signing in. I hope this has been useful for you. And uh, it's always, you're always welcome to leave feedback and that would be very helpful for me and, and also for Eva as we try to improve these webinars. We do have a webinar series coming up. Um, you can find all of our webinars on the Makeover Monday website. If you go to makeovermonday.co.uk slash webinars, um, you can see all the ones that we have coming up. Uh, we have uh, a three-part series on stats for data visualization with Anna Forge coming up. Um, she uh, has a great website for learning about stats, and uh, she's going to start with a um, uh, an explanation of linear regression for linear and nonlinear data sets. And that might sound like a pretty meaty topic, but Anna is a high school teacher. So she has to learn how to explain all this stuff to kids. And if you've read her blog posts, they're particularly, uh, particularly interesting. So, um, okay, well, I guess that is all, all of the questions. I don't see anybody else with any more. Um, okay, and thank you for the people that are saying Thank you, and that they found it helpful. That's good. Okay. So uh, I guess we'll leave it there. If you have any additional questions, feel free to, to reach me on Twitter. And again, it's BizWizBI. You can, you can ask me some questions there. And I'll post the slides and the recording on my blog on uh, bizwiz.com. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you attending today. And uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.